very warm welcome to our audience who are watching from all over the world. A very warm good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. We have a very eminent professional with us who knows all about green. So let's start with an introduction to our speaker today, um, Mr. Mahesh. Before that, I will just introduce you to the WFM community, why we are here and the reason for these kind of awareness session we are organizing. And uh, we welcome our audience um, to be attentive, to ask questions uh, to Mahesh. He is a, a treasure chest of knowledge on green. So you, I'm sure I'm expecting a lot of questions from you. Um, so let me start with an introduction to uh, the WFM media and WFM community. So I hope uh, you all can uh, see the screen now. WFM Media, we started in the year 2013 and it is almost nine years since we started with the community for professionals in the window and facade industry, connecting people with the uh, knowledge sharing professionals, including brands, including research people, including uh, teachers who are in the field, including uh, organizations like GBC and various other people who can teach you how to go green, how to build better for a better future. So um, we have come up with the idea of webinars last year during the lockdown time and we thought it is very essential to teach people and connect people using this community, sharing knowledge, sharing awareness on products, sharing awareness on various aspects which will improve building construction technology and uh, for the AEC sector. So today's topic is why going green is good for your business. So when you are looking at business, you always look for a sustainable business, right? So today's uh, discussion point include uh, why green building is important, US GBC, how they lead the global green building movement, sustainable business, how to realize sustainable business through sustainable policies, role of government and other agencies in attaining sustainability and the future of building industry, how uh, we can move forward with um, various net zero buildings, uh, regenerating and how to prepare the world for a better future. So we have Mr. Mahesh Ramanujam, President, CEO, US Green Building Council, President and CEO of Green Business Certification. Welcome, sir, to this uh, program, Mr. Uh, Mahesh. Very warm welcome to you. Uh, as a President and CEO of US GBC and GBCI, Mahesh leads a community of 13 million people in the world, and it is growing every day. He's a graduate from Anamala University, um, uh, from, uh, uh, it is near Chennai, right? So he is a computer engineer by uh, profession and he has a strong background of technology and innovation, um, a deadly background, in fact, building a healthy community, community and sustainable living. Ram Ramanujan serves a number of boards and advisory committees, which you can read on our website. Go to click uh, his profile, you can read a lot about him. We have added all these things over there. Uh, he leads um, the American National Community Advisory Council uh, as a board of advisory, as well as um, GRESB, which is again a part of GBCI. Uh, before um, becoming the president and CEO of US GBC, I had been working with various uh, uh, cor corporates like uh, IBM, Lenovo, and other, other organizations. Um, his uh, aim is to transform uh, building for uh, betterment of the community and betterment of people. He leads, as I said, hundreds of employees and thousands of volunteers who work tirelessly as a backbone of the green building movement. So welcome, sir, to this program. And uh, thank you, Ms. forward. You can ask him questions at the end. We have a chat box. Please uh, post your questions. And in the end, we will be asking uh, uh, these questions to uh, Mr. Mahesh. Uh, welcome to all of you once again. So let us start with um, your role, uh, role as uh, the chairman or the topmost positions in U USGBC. And how did it happen? As USGBC is the forefront of green building standards for the past 25 years, what is the message that you would like to give people? And how did you start your career in USGBC and what all you have done? It's a, it's a long question. <laughs> so thank you again for having me and it's wonderful to be here with the WFM Media. 
and most importantly, do the important part of our work, which is educating everybody about why green buildings are important, and particularly why green buildings are important part of building a good business or a great business, I should say. Uh, you know, my journey with USGBC started uh, uh, as a consultant in technology. And uh, in 2009, uh, I joined USGBC to help with a, a technology project because of my background in technology and after doing multiple business transformation projects, I, I, I had the opportunity to connect with USGBC on that particular project. And what happened was uh, it, uh, it created a larger awakening in me about seeing the potential of this organization, the power of this organization. Yes. And, and the power of this organization to change lives. And through better buildings, we can build better lives. That became very clear to me. And as, as, as a leader who has spent a lot of time in the business and technology side, I realized this allows me a chance to pay it forward because sustainability for all of us Indians in particular has been in our core roots. So always the life has been about really passing the gifts you have, the blessings you have to somebody else. And no better place to work at USGBC uh, and in the world other than USGBC because USGBC and its leaders and thousands of volunteers around the world are driven by a common cause, better buildings equal better lives. So, so that's how my journey with USGBC started. And to the mission of the organization, it's very simple, is that traditional construction, traditional design, traditional operations of buildings create a uh, substantial burden on the environment, the economy, and the people. And our goal at USGBC, along with our members and our partners, and of course, our volunteers and stakeholders is that, is to be able to transform building design practices, construction practices, and operation practices to be green. What that means is that we make sure buildings are less having less impact on the environment. I mean, negative impact, a stronger impact on the economy, positive impact, and most importantly, take care of the important asset in these assets in these buildings, which is people. So the bottom line for our, our goal is very, very simple. Better buildings equal better lives. And through that, uh, we can lead better lives. And also we can change better lives. And sometimes we can save better lives. So that's basically the idea of US Green Building Council. Yeah, absolutely true. I know that uh, a lot of people from USGBC work towards and uh, towards sustainability. And I think in India, we have been always following the principles of sustainability when we are looking at one of the buildings or the material which we have been using in the uh, earlier times. But uh, today we are going imitating more and more uh, uh, westernizing our probably the designs and the material which we are using. Uh, how should people build sustainability in a built environment? Can you uh, just elaborate on that? What are the key factors to consider? I think the most important thing to remember is that is to the first step is is not to build things the way you used to build. You know what that means is that you know it is very easy to get uh, focused on a project, particularly in India and, and in in the in the regions that we are current, currently developing around the world. It's very easy to focus on speed and compromise quality. I think it is very very important to remember buildings outlast most of our lifetimes. That's why we build them. And we have thousands of examples of buildings that are outlasted our lifetimes. So yes. first remembering that a building is going to outlast our lifetime. That means that you have to take a long-term approach. And what does long-term approach means is that being able to look at design, being able to look at construction, being able to look at the operations of the building over a life cycle of the building and say that what we are going to build today, will it have a less impact on the environment? Will it solve the most important need, which is to make the place to be the most uh, likable and livable place for a human or an occupant. And third is that is how do we drive economic prosperity around the community, which means that you focus on the basics, which is that how do we make sure we have energy sustenance? How do we focus on we save water, we conserve water? Because you know, as a person coming from Chennai, uh, for nine months in a year, we are always struggling with, uh, with, with, with the need for clean water. And that's true for most parts of India, but you know, I'm speaking about Chennai because it's my hometown. And uh, being able to conserve water, and then the third part is to be able to really look at the indoor air quality and as well as the external air quality. You know, particularly the pandemic uh, last year has clearly shown us the importance of how we need to continue to focus on indoor air quality. And, and it is very sadly, I note that Delhi is one of the most polluted cities in the world. Before the pandemic, uh, it, it was spoken about pretty much every day. So when you look at these three basics, I look at energy, water, and, and I look at uh, indoor air quality. And then with India, we had also focus on waste, you know, waste. And it's, it's true for the rest of the world, but in India, waste has got a direct correlation to our lifestyle. And wherever we go, we could make our places more cleaner and healthier. 
So that is the fourth part. And then the fifth part is that is just by the common sense aspect of really reducing resources. Resources being the significant resource that goes into a building is the materials, is the products. Not looking at the materials just from the perspective of where they are being consumed, but looking at the overall life cycle of the, from production to the production site, uh, you have to look at the attributes of how you're manufacturing uh, a material to get to a building and what methods and what transportation you're using. And of course, public transportation plays a big role. Uh, in India, particularly, again, it plays a very important role, both from an economic affordability point of view, as well as reducing the carbon footprint. Yeah. All of this uh, has to focus on uh, the most important thing is to reduce carbon emissions. What that means is that is you're creating a lesser impact on the climate, which means we can take on uh, the single largest existential threat of our lifetime, climate change, in a much more clearer and bolder way by building better buildings and ensuring there are better lives not for the current generation, but also for the future generation. So that to me is the cycle of sustainability you have to incorporate. And of course, we have tools like LEAD, uh, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, allows you to naturally integrate those principles in your design, construction, operations, and most importantly, the performance of those buildings. That's how you get started. Great to know about these five, five principles which you must use while building green for the future. Yeah. So uh, what is the impact of green building, which is created sustainable built environment? Like we say that this many, 5, 10, 15% of building in India is green or sustainable or it is rated. So do you think that the strategies of new buildings are followed when uh, we build new buildings, which are looking at the operational cost also? So you are building green and you are saying that 15% of the building is either platinum rated or gold rated or silver rated. But um, when you look at the operational cost of the building, is it true that it is still a um, platinum or a gold or a silver rated building? Uh, it is a great question. You know, so uh, when we build a new construction practices, we spend a lot of time focusing on the design strategies and construction strategies. And as you rightly pointed out, how good is a design? How good is a, a construction if you cannot really uh, measure its progress on operations, right? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the building construction would probably last from five to 10 years, you know, depending upon which building it is. But the real cost of the building comes when you really operate the building. And that's probably for a lifetime, let's say for 30 years. Yes. So first of all, our theory is this, what gets measured gets done, what gets done gets improved, what gets improved gets replicated. So when you look at it from that perspective, we have to put a lot of emphasis on the measurement to your point about, are we getting the real benefits of green? Are we really being able to deliver the results that we thought we would get from building, making a building green? So I think uh, uh, there are thousands of examples around the world where individual buildings and individual business leaders, including in India, who have been able to clearly demonstrate that through data, through the performance of energy, water, waste, transportation, and most importantly, the measurement of indoor quality, they've been able to prove that both the intangible and the tangible value of green buildings exist. Now, the question becomes this very clear line. People who are not doing it, people who are not gotten started on that journey, uh, have a skepticism, right? Because they don't know uh, whether their building is performing or not. It's simple reason is because they are not started with measurement. So what I always say to people is that people who have measured it are focused on three things. First, they know where they are. So if you built a platinum building and if you went to gold, you will ask a question, why am I getting a, a lower rating? when I should have gotten a higher rating. That creates a proper awareness to the project teams to take corrective actions. Second, let's say that you were, you were at gold and you want to go to platinum. You are then starting to think about how do I drive continuous improvement to go to the next level, which means you're going to introspect strategies that are going to continuously going to be evolved inside the building practice, particularly from an operations point of view. For example, how you use your energy, how you use your uh, waste, how people consume waste, and how you save water, and how is your indoor air quality performing, and, and when it is good and when it is bad, and how does it connect to the external indoor air quality. These type of thought processes can quickly evolve because you have data to prove it. And last but not the least is that, is that let's say you're a portfolio owner, you have, you have multiple buildings, then you start learning from one building to the other, or you learn from the buildings from the rest of the world by knowing that what are the better in class practices are out there, so that you, you're always constantly implementing the next practice while mastering the best practice. So that's basically what we have seen. So I would say the short answer is green buildings perform, but to make sure that they are performing, you need to start with measurement. 
So there is always a starting point and slowly we are evolving over a period of time. There is uh, a lot of improvements and a lot of policy which we are following, which uh, because of organizations like uh, GBC and Griha and all these uh, rating systems, what we have. So the role of architects and urban designers uh, who are the stakeholders uh, in ensuring a sustainable built environment uh, in the pressure of time, like you know, the uh, budget and the time, very important. Uh, how do you bring sustainability considering these constraints? That is, how to build a better uh, building or an asset uh, sustainably, considering the time, budget, and how architects and urban designers can overcome the pressure from looking at the budget point of view as well as you know, uh, the time. I think uh, there are uh, three ways to look at it. The first thing is that is, uh, we are living in the 21st century and it is very hard to build a building that is not green, right? Uh, the, whether whether you incorporated all the features of green, that could be debated. But you know, but from a, from a general common sense point of view, I would be surprised if any building is going to be inferior in its design, construction, and operational practice than a building that was built 25 years or 35 years ago, simply because the technology is improved the knowledge is improved. And most importantly, uh, consumers are more savvy to know that what to demand, right? The, a larger level of education has happened. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that a green is a green has gone mainstream. Now the question is how dark your green is, whether, whether you are lighter green to the darker green, that's the question that you have to constantly ask. And always, you know, budget, you, you know, budget challenges and schedule challenges and scope challenges are always being part of construction projects around the world. So it's not a new thing today. It has been the same thing 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So when you really look at it, what we always say, what personally I try to ask people is that is, do you have a minimum design standard that you are looking at from an architectural point of view and really imbibing those best practices into that design, right? Within the budget that's allowed for you. Because what we don't want is that we don't want green to become a premium. We don't want green to become an, for only for the affordable. Then, then we are not building a, a very equitable society because green should be available to all, right? I mean, everybody has the right to have clean air and save energy and most importantly, conserve water. So the, the fundamental principle of incorporating the basics into the design principle is well institutionalized by the architecture community. So that argument is already won. Then the second question is that is, whenever the question of cost comes, a question of value also should be brought forward. What is the value we are trying to generate? What view we are taking? Are we taking a long-term view or a short-term view? No, so, you know, that's a very important perspective from a budget point of view. And third is that this pandemic has taught us very clearly a very important thing. Last year, if you take the collective loss the entire world has faced uh, due to this pandemic, we could not quantify any kind of shortcuts that went into really getting to that point. So nobody was willing to take any shortcuts last year. What I mean by that is clearly it became very clear that the environmental health and the individual health have a very clear correlation. Now, this is for a pandemic that we have been able to, uh, you know, hopefully tackle in the, in the, in the, in the, by the end of this year, we, we will be in a good place. But what about climate change? What about the most existential threat of our lifetime? A climate change that could be much, much, much more bigger, much, much more undefined and much, much more impactful. None of us know how it will look like. What is the price are we ready to pay? Or should we even be ready to pay that kind of price? When you start asking that question, I think these conversations about short-term costs, short-term uh, thinking around how do you drive a budget and a schedule just to meet the now, the needs of the now, really extrapolating to the needs of the future is very, very crucial. So I think uh, the bottom line is there is, we give we should give more credit to the industry for incorporating more green what it is, what is already there uh, because of the evolved business, business practices. Second, that people should not try to look at uh, in a two-dimensional way, just a scope and uh, and schedule and, of course, the budget. They should also look beyond the larger costs. And last but not the least, we cannot forget the 2020 impact and the global lockdown, and particularly the suffering, continued suffering India is going through. And we have to definitely take a long-term approach. And as a country, um, we have been now 70 plus years in independence, and we have, we have more work to do on that front in terms of really thinking about long-term and really building things for the long-term. And buildings are by default long-term. So we should take a very careful approach. So I think uh, the pandemic has taught a lot of lessons, like Indeed. for fresh air, good sunlight, optimum sunlight, and 
all these things which we have learned during this pandemic time and uh, the lifestyle has changed a lot yes uh, across the globe there are so many green building rating systems available today like in india we have two and there is um, usgbc is probably it is slightly different from what we have catered for indian green building uh, the certification same like uh, we have in other countries also the green rating systems are there uh, do you think that the rating systems are confusing for the designers or giving some guidance on this like for example some german company is establishing their office in india probably require look at their own uh, green building certification process and the policies which they follow is it confusing uh yeah, yeah first of all you know we are happy that there are so many rating systems out there which means that as i mentioned earlier it's about evolution of the industry the industry needs more tools not less tools more opportunities to drive transformation and we don't want to define a particular way of doing this change because the industry is rapidly changing and if you look at the rapid urbanization that has happened in the last two decades the rapid urbanization also also resulted in moving million people billion people out of extreme poverty around the world so uh, we are very happy that urban development has come with significant economic development to the society but also at the cost of environment so let's not forget it has put a significant stress on the environment so what we want to continue to underscore is that better tools that helps improvise our design construction and operational practices in the built environment is crucial so this is where rating systems like lead have led the way lead is the most popular and 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 well implemented lead rating system around the world in more than 181 countries and territories we are at 28 billion square feet of certified space and registered space so the list goes on now when you really look at these rating systems what we are always advocating for is that we want people to incorporate the better in class practices that makes best sense for them so we don't really regiment it at least from us green building point council point of view we don't say only pick lead or pick brium or pick dgnb or griha or igbc rating system what we continue to ask is whatever you do do it with the highest quality do it with highest rigor and most importantly figure out how you are going to measure it in the future right that's the most important part so this is not about pushing the rating system this is about pushing the best in class practices so when you start doing it we also ask you to look at what's out there and really pick the choice of the system that's going to actually get you to the next level right whatever it is so why would you buy a phone that was popular 5 years ago if you're going to buy a new phone you better buy a phone that's more latest and greatest today right i mean we do that in a day to day choice a consumer choice that we make with a simple thing like a phone which is going to last for probably 4 or 5 years we make such kind of a conscientious decision about always being current and being focused on the future so when you're building a building that is going to outlast your lifetime then you should always go to the better in class practices and of course uh, being the leader of lead i will always advocate for lead lead is the that's why we continue to evolve we we continue to improve lead and most importantly continue to make lead as the next practice and also the best practice in the world but the long and short answer of the question is that we are not too much worried about uh, having too many rating systems in the world but what we continue to ask is that these rating systems continue to evolve the best practices for the industry and really bring the the right level of impact to the environment to the people and the economy so yeah it can be confusing but let's look at the rest of the world how many green buildings have been implemented around the world so when you look at the number the number is so small still compared to the overall real estate that has been built so from that perspective though we have numerous rating systems the the issue is not with the rating system the issue is with a rating system or a group of rating systems scaling across the environment and that's where we are focused right so it's all based on your analysis your measurements for the building system how much energy how much of cost and the balance between that right so and what makes sense to you obviously that, yeah <laughs> uh so for everyone everything is a business right it's making money so after all the ultimate aim is uh, of course you shouldn't be at a loss so how can we break or translate sustainability into the benefit of business i think our businesses are already benefiting right if you look at the uh, real estate leaders uh, green buildings do command a, a good premium on rent do command a good premium on their uh, real estate value and then if you are a product manufacturer you are able to differentiate your products because your products are sustainable healthy and have a lesser burden on the environment 
And then if you're a larger organization that is trying to recruit talent, of course, the next generation and the present generation, as I said earlier, are largely aware and conscientious about what the environmental uh, responsibility that we have for our planet. And we all have this common, common uh, goal of really being able to make sure that the, the spaces we occupy, uh, while we are taking enough from the mother earth, we are, also not, we are also not leaving it in a bad state than what we have inherited it. So there is a larger conscientious going on. So being, being that the case, the, the organization that have implemented sustainable policies are able to attract talent. So when you really look at it, uh, if clearly there is an economic case for your brand. There is a clearly an economic case for your, uh, your talent development. There is also a clearly an economic case on your operational costs and of course your long-term uh, uh, asset appreciation value. So these, these cases have been proven over and over again by organizations that have implemented sustainability as a strategy and as a core value in their businesses uh, around the world. Now, with the larger awareness of the environmental social governance, uh, we have also seen in the last five to seven years, a significant influx of funds into real estate investment trusts, REITs, uh, pension funds, uh, the ETFs, the stock, all kinds of investment instruments around the world have received significant amount of investment into their accounts because the investors are demanding not only profits, but they're also demanding that those be allocated to the right level of efforts that either mitigates climate change or improves the social fabric of our uh, larger humanity or uh, at the same time really improves the equitability around the world. While obviously investors are going to be focused on return on investment, but it's also about return on impact, return on impact on the environment, return on impact on the people, and of course, return on impact, of course, in investment on the, on the economies that you are trying to deploy. So from that perspective, I think uh, the maturity of businesses adopting sustainability has significant increase. And there is a clear business case about why people are doing it and it is three dimensional. That is, we call it the triple bottom line. And yeah. the pandemic has further understood the importance of it more than ever. Absolutely true. It's more than operational. I think uh, ROI, what you pointed out, I think the retain, uh, retaining your employees, I've heard that the younger generation of people will love to work in their offices when this is more easy to breathe, more easy to work, a green, better environment. I think even to uh, maintain your clientele, if you're a real estate developer or a builder, exactly. uh, the green helps, right? Condition. Indeed. Yeah. So, I want to know the business across the world has put sustainability in their vision, mission. Many builders are going for absolutely green building and it has become a statement in today's world, right? Do you think that the true sustainability is available in the built environment considering the construction cost, looking at the resources which we are using? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, there are thousands of examples around the world as I highlighted earlier there is a significant amount of progress has been made at all levels in the built environment, be it at an investor level, be it a developer level, a designer's level, architect's level, and even at an operational level, over and over and over again, we have seen data, we have seen evidence, we have seen financial results, and most importantly, we have, we have seen people trying to take those, those return on investments and reinvest it back into the business to go to the next level. So I, I don't think we need any more debate about whether there is a return on investment on sustainability. That's not the concern. The second thing there is the customers or the businesses that have been prepared with sustainability are ready to tackle on challenges like climate change, uh, which is this big hidden dark thing that's out there. We are, none of us know what it means, but the more and more you can mitigate risk for your businesses, particularly if your assets are in risk prone zones, you have to, you have to be even more careful and really make sure that these assets are, assets are protected. That's number one. But the second part of the conversation is that is that you are you are much better prepared than businesses that were not. So again, last year brings a very interesting conversation about resilience, right? We, it was not about climate resilience last year, but it was it started as a it started as a human health and wellness resilience, right? How, how are people going to be resilient in these in these in these places? I think very soon you will see study as people finish re-entering that companies that have done a good work on sustainability were better prepared to tackle the mm -hmm. pandemic than the companies that were 
not prepared with sustainability. So very clearly, I, I think I, I'm predicting, let's see how the data plays out in the next few months, is that I'm predicting that companies that have done a good job with sustainability have been able to inherit that mindset of being proactive, being conscientious, and being really focused on the future and tackling risk better than the companies that were not. And pandemic response would be a good measurement to really see how sustainability also paid us in some indirect, indirect ways. That's the first point. The other point that we need to constantly think about that is that is that the importance of tackling sustainability is also to be as prepared as we can be for a resilient event. You are sitting in Mumbai. I'm from Chennai, and uh, we saw extreme heat is going through the north, the north corridor of the of the country. All these things create significant risk and impact on the quality of life of citizens particularly the people who are living below the poverty line. And unfortunately in India, it's below 70%, right? It's about 70%. Yes. So when you really look at this, what is, the, what is the direct impact and correlation that is going to have on the vulnerable among us has to be factored in by any businesses. So I think, uh, I think from that perspective, uh, businesses are a lot more conscientious, back to again ESG, the environmental, social and governance. The social aspect of business is very conscientiously focused on saying, yes, we want to make money. We want to be successful. We want to pay our employees well, but our stakeholders, stakeholders are also demanding that we take care of the people around us really well. And how do you do that effectively? That is only the only way to do that is by incorporating sustainability, health and wellness, resilience, and equitable strategies into your businesses. So the narrative of sustainability is quietly expanding to these big four topics and, uh, and the businesses are largely ready to take on this challenge. Now, more results are needed, more data is needed, and of course, you're going to learn a lot from this pandemic, but those are improvements. But I am very optimistic that the foundation that we have will allow us to address the intersectionality of sustainability, health and wellness, resilience, and equity that is needed to survive the post-pandemic crisis and most importantly, a post-pandemic uh, you know, recovery and also uh, to tackle the single largest existential threat of our lifetime, climate change. Absolutely. I think we are learning it in a slowly, but steadily we are learning all these process and uh, bring these all in our daily lives as well as for the future generation, right? So uh, coming to your favorite part of uh, the, <laughs> the climate change and the environmental dis uh, degradation, which you always spoke about. And whenever we speak about uh, climate change, it is all affecting the entire world, the extinction of species and the resources. Pollution is a major issue again. Uh, the only way to combat combat these through the collective action of our population as well as the government, right? So, what is the impact of government policies, uh, and how important it is to draft policies which support sustainability and business acumen? Please brief on the roles played by the government as well as other agencies. I think government has a significant larger role to play. Yeah, you know, a good policy is always uh, uh, leads to good governance and good governance leads to uh, definitely better lives. So since we are focused on better lives, a good policy and a good governance around the built environments, you know, design construction and most importantly operational practices is, is a, an important and a critical component of success for our trans success component for our uh, transformation efforts. So when you look at that, I think we see government as uh, government playing three roles, right? Number one, government as an example. Government can lead by example, because you, as you realize around the world, government is also one of the largest landowners, largest employers, largest building owners. So every building that we can go into, if that becomes a sustainable building, you have set a very high bar for everybody else to replicate, right? I mean, that's the very easiest thing a government can do by, by focusing on the core tenants. You don't need to put all that you don't need to make every building a platinum, but if you took the right steps to make them all enough green and then demonstrate that you have better design, you have better construction, you have better operations, and to your earlier point, we have better measurement to prove that the green is working, that would be a significant step. And particularly in India, you can see that throughout the country, we have, we have, we have thousands and thousands of buildings that you could really uh, transform to create a larger impact. That is the first point. Second point is that government obviously has the ability to implement policies policies that incentivizes as well as regulates, right? The, the, the nature of how business is done. 
And always we like good policy because good policy gives good certainty to the market. And when you have good certainty, it leads to good economic prosperity because businesses are always looking for certainty from the government. Anything that is certain, anything that is defined, anything that is considered more, more like these are the guidances that you should use because the government thinks it's a good thing to do. I think, I think there, is a, there is definitely a, a good growth momentum we can build on the backbone of policies, which is very evident from the work that we have done with LEAD around the world. And even in India, wherever we had stronger policies, be it at a municipal government level or be it at a city government level or a state government or a national government, we have seen the transformation efforts to be accelerated. So that's a very clear correlation. And then the last but not the least, uh, you know that many, many, many projects around the world have public private partnerships. You know, there are, there are a lot of, lot of where public funds are being deployed along with the private capital. So when you do that, it is very important that a taxpayer money is always allocated to responsible growth. And when we say responsible growth, a responsible growth cannot come by ignoring the environment, the people it serves or it, it hosts, and the most importantly, driving the economic prosperity for the poorest and the vulnerable among us. That is the role of the government. So when you look at it from that perspective, being able to have clear policies, a policy to lead by example, a policy to regulate the private sector so that the private sector can go faster, quicker to doing the right thing by the people, and a policy that allocates capital smartly so that it always benefits the single largest customer of the government, the poor people in any part of the world is the, is the, is the key construct. So we see that we see the role of government is not playing the government as their leader, but also sometimes a follower, sometimes as an enabler, and sometimes as a regulator. Although regulator is not my favorite, uh, I don't prefer regulation that much right. because I think a open market concepts are better. But however, still sometimes the regulation also helps in terms of really defining the minimum for the market. I really don't know whether how much it will work as a regulator, the government can work as a regulator. But still, do you think that uh, there is a <laughs> for ban mandatory rules? Uh, when you, uh, I think the government, uh, CPWD, for example, is the largest uh, builder in India. There are lots of projects which is coming up and huge amount of money being invested on government projects. Uh, you think that some policies should become mandatory so that you know, we can be in a better condition or better uh, built environment? I think, I think it is very important to understand a very simple difference between a code and a green building rating system, right? Uh, when in 1993, 94, there was no clear green code. There was no clear uh, building code. There was no clear uh, green building rating system. So all of them are mixed up. But now we have a very clear definition. To me, the role of code is mandatory, right? You, you have mandatory code which is the building codes that gives you the regulatory or the mandatory baseline, which is like saying the minimum, right? Of course, we want buildings in India to be smoking free, right? We don't want people to be smoking inside those buildings because we know that it affects directly indoor air quality. We don't want people to be throwing trashes around their households or their buildings. That is a cleanliness issue. And that also affects the poorest among us. And being able to make our buildings accessible to all so that we don't make it only available for the, for the affordable versus the non-affordable. These things could become what I would say a simple expectation of life and also known as the minimum things that you should follow. To me, the role of courts is that. That's where the mm -hmm. mandatory role comes. But when you come to rating systems like LEED or any rating system, their job is to go above court, is to encourage people to go beyond court. So at that time, what you don't want to do is that is you don't want to make it mandatory. I can't demand and I can mandate that you should buy a 85 inch TV in your home. You know, that's kind of feels a little silly. Right. I, I, I don't think I, I think that that is that's not very, very effective. But if you want to buy a 100 inch TV, feel free. If you want to buy a 60 inch TV, feel free. But as long as you, you are you are you are able to make the choice, as long as you are able to see the return on investment, as long as you're able to see that this is how I'm going to differentiate myself from the competition, going to improve my brand value, save my money. You know, all those things are coming. And this is the concept that we have tried to really always focus on. So that means that. Yeah, leadership standard of today will become the code of tomorrow, but we need to continue to evolve the leadership standard because what we are trying to get the market is from move from status quo to where we need to go. Where we need to go is very far away. Where we are right now is, is, is definitely an important point, but where, where we need to go is very, very far away to tackle climate change. So I truly believe leadership standards should not be mandatory, 
should be voluntary, should be driven by markets and be by business leaders because their people think that that's a leadership premise. And then the code should follow right along it so that we don't leave the, the, that to be a too much of a choice for people to implement the obvious practices uh, and that should become, we call it the prerequisite or the minimum or the, or the minimum code to go to the next level. So that's the idea of, or at least the philosophy that we at the US Green Building Council try to follow between uh, uh, rating systems and leadership standards and particularly with the lead and uh, other, uh, other uh, constructs that comes in terms of improving the built environment's best practices. Okay, so uh, it may not be possible to make it mandatory, but still the government has in, uh, implemented a lot of incentives as well as the penalties. Uh, for example, the poli policies like EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, uh, will they fast track or slow down the approvals? Because we have to go through various windows for any kind of project. It's already slowing down so many approvals. And how would such penalties or incentives would help for building better future or better? Growth? I think incentives are always welcome. Uh, any streamlining of processes, particularly connected to environmental clearance is always welcome. Integrating these points of uh, uh, approvals uh, is, is always welcome. You know, these things only uh, reinforce the principles that we've been talking about, building a better building. But it cannot come at the cost of bureaucracy. It cannot add further cost to the, to the projects. As you touched on it earlier, scope and schedule is always tight. That means budget is always uh, is, is, is lesser, right? No, no project in the world has got enough budget, right? Everybody is on a short-term budget. So process efficiency is super important. And most importantly, particularly mandatory approvals should be expedited as fast as possible. This is why we always recommend that when a government lays out policies like that, they leverage organizations like us, GBCI, Green Business Certification Inc., to really automate that clearance. For example, in the US and around the world, there are so many examples where people have said that instead of the EIA, if you got a certain level of LEED certification, be it a silver, gold, or platinum, depending upon where that, that criteria matches, we will recognize that as an alternate path. So these things take the load of the government. These things take away the, the process and the bureaucracy out of it and also it builds capacity so that the government itself can continue to define policies better policies while building an ecosystem that can respond and support those policies in terms of execution so i think that is very very critical component if the government is going to take on and do everything then obviously you're going to see a slowdown because there are not enough resources in the government or if they are they have to follow a certain level of uh, order and principles and that always uh, is is lagging the industry's expectation yeah. so that's first part the second part is that incentives always help, right? Incentives always help. And you know that with, with improved FAR, improved uh, land allocation uh, uh, points, uh, we have seen that people were incentivized to do better things. But we also believe that incentives alone should not drive it, right? Mm -hmm. For example, a carrot and a stick approach will be helpful because for, for example, there should be, I have been advocating for a penalty for not building green. Right? Why would a bank give you a, an in, a loan with the same interest rate for a building that is green and non-green? That doesn't make any sense to me. So to me, green should not, we don't need to incentivize green, but we should penalize people who are not building green because they are creating some kind of risk to the environment. They're creating some kind of an inferior product than a traditional construction practice could be. So I think, I think incentives are super important because the governments can give it, but we also need to be cognizant that government cannot keep giving money away. Then it becomes a very interesting trend because what happens there is that when the incentive goes away, the people's motivation to do the task also seems to be challenged. Sometimes goes away, but sometimes they're challenged. So I find that process to be a little inefficient. And, uh, and uh, starting this year, I've seen some massive changes where uh, you saw that with the new decisions that have been taken by the climate banks and the various federal regulators, financial regulators, they are now trying to look at climate change as one of the risk component to the economy. And they're trying to look at how we can increase interest rates for assets or even discourage people investing in those assets because those assets can become uh, a, a risk to the overall economy. Now, that concept can be now incorporated by the government as well, uh, be it a property tax or be it a... Uh, you, you know, income tax or be it your uh, use tax, whatever the tax mechanisms are, I think that's uh, that could be the next uh, frontier that's emerging. So 
definitely in the meantime incentives are or always helpful because anything for people to do the right thing i'm all for it yeah rightly said um i think uh for india i think the smaller uh, housing problem a lot of housing problem is in india when you look at uh, the villages always building sustainable whereas we are going into high level uh, higher uh, build, uh, taller buildings and we are using a lot of glass lo other than the other locally available material which is not possible for while building uh, such 60 70 floor buildings so um, the problems of all these you know the cost of building is uh, major thing with what people are looking at so um, as a building sustainability expert you have been working on the built environment and what are the gaps do you see while implementing sustainability in a built environment the i think the biggest the, the the biggest gap is that is there is a lot of interest that everybody is focused on transforming a new building right when you buy and when you build a new building everybody wants to make it the best green building out there but the challenge that i constantly see is that is that treatment is not consistent with the existing buildings so when you take existing buildings there is not enough momentum uh to really turn those existing buildings also to be green as fast as they can mm -hmm. even taking incremental steps i i think that needs more work and uh because we cannot forget that 97% of the buildings around the world are still existing buildings so we cannot we cannot tackle climate change by just focusing on new construction that's the first part second body that we touched on that earlier which is that a biggest gap is that is not enough data is available right data operational data consistent operational data that continuously demonstrates green works green delivers benefits that's needed from a larger public awareness point of view the more people get data and people use data to drive those decisions then this green decisions will not be arbitrary or if these decisions are being made at least we will be able to show demonstrate a certain level of consistency and last but not the least education we cannot underscore the importance of education particularly the education of the lay person because as much as you as a developer you are giving a green building if you really want the green building to maintain its platinum rating then you need everybody to participate be it a consumer be it a resident be it a office owner everybody must contribute to that particular effort of saving energy saving water and really keeping the building uh, from less uh, uh, more carbon emissions and last but not the least the maintaining the indoor air quality and the the cleanliness and the waste around the building of course transportation is a big part of it so really education of people beyond the typical speaking orbit that we all talk about ourselves right we both are like informed audience but but when we think about the lay person how are we bringing them along and how are we educating consumers to really think about green also has their responsibility is an important concept so these three areas i believe uh, needs significant improvement in the next decade yes. so that we can get to the we can get to the ultimate goal how do you find that you know in, in you have been working in india as well as in us what's the major changes i mean us i think it's much better compared to india and how do you fill that gap of where do you, where are we lacking compared to uh, us when you are going for such I, i think i think we have many challenges right we have many many challenges we have economic challenges we have a, we are a large service economy uh, we have to we have to really uh, we have to really evolve our practices to be at a global level right i mean to 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 do that i think us all committing that we want to improve is a significant step right now even even i call this the chalta hai you know that that kind of a attitude still survives within the the common dust that's where i think educating the larger public is very very important what i will confidently say is that as i met thousands of people when i travel in india i have never seen anybody who said i don't care about the environment i don't care about my fellow human and i don't care about money i never heard that but what happens is that that doesn't translate into day to day practices right be it, be it the be it our uh, discipline on the road or to being able to have a discipline in a in a worker construction site or in our discipline to demand quality or in our uh, in our we, we don't try to have a good expectation for ourselves right by saying that i want a better house i want a high quality house i want to save water i do want to not have impact on the environment i think that's where i think there is a a significant help needed for our community to learn and said like look you can demand it and you can have it and that's the most important part i would say is where i think we should bridge the gap with the rest right. of the world right 
So I would um, remind the audience that we are almost towards the last 10 minutes of the session. If you have any questions, you can post it on the uh, chat box. Uh, continuing with the interview, uh, where do you think that uh, this entire building sustainability movement is heading to? I think the I think the pandemic the pandemic has shown us, as I said earlier, the inextricable link between the environment, the human health, and the economy. So last year, India was dealing with the pandemic lockdown, still dealing with it, but we also saw people were getting displaced. Next only to Afghanistan, 929,000 people got displaced because of climate. So here you are dealing with a pandemic and you're being kicked out of your house, kicked out of your location, of your city, because you're dealing with a pandemic, be it a flood, be it a fire, be it heat, and you're being kicked out of one place to go to the other. Only next one lead to Afghanistan. So that to me is a very uh, disturbing statistic because now you're dealing with two major crises, a climate crisis and a health crisis, a public health crisis, right? right. So we tend to, so we can no longer look at these things in isolation or as a single issue topic. So to really say where we are headed, where we need to go to tackle all of these issues. And then last year we saw an issue that we have seen in India forever, which is an inequality issue, income inequality, societal inequality, uh, health disparities, economic inequalities, you know, all kinds of inequalities in the country that we constantly face. When you really look at it, we have to clearly be clear on one thing. A sustainable world is meaningless if it's not an equitable world, period, right? That's the first point. So based on the three simple points, three simple points. Point number one, all the existing buildings must get to zero. So we should commit that all existing buildings should get to zero emission. And then all new construction should strive to starting becoming positive from now on because hitting zero doesn't work, right? Zero energy works, zero water works, zero waste works, but zero health, zero equity, zero economy doesn't work. So attempting to go to zero for new doesn't make any sense to me. So you have to go to positive, which means that you have to have a positive impact on the environment, positive impact on the people, of course, the health and social, emotional and physical well-being of the people. And then the last one, positive impact on the economy and that means we are creating a positive quality of life for the citizens around the world, particularly coming out of this emerges uh, of this uh, of this uh, of this pandemic crisis. So the third point is that we must continue to focus on the intersectionality of sustainability, health and wellness, resilience and equity. Now, most of mm -hmm. us don't know what that exactly means, but that's where we have to go next, because that's how we will be able to build a stronger world coming out of this this pandemic. That's where we are going. The education plays a big role imparting knowledge plays a big big role right from uh, the lower level to the students to the builders and up high in the governance level right so absolutely sure, absolutely uh, agencies uh, the organizations like idbc can play a great role in imparting this knowledge and bringing people together to lead them to a higher level higher living standard higher levels of sustainability so kindly wise mm -hmm. Future generation on designing future proof buildings which are absolutely sustainable. We are in the uh, age of net zero building, whereas we are spending millions of rupees uh, on, on heat and uh, air conditioning. So please talk about this future proof buildings considering sustainability. I think the future proof buildings are the buildings that I just highlighted that are on a continuous improvement path, leverages the better technologies that comprehensively incorporates the positive, or I would call it as the regenerative strategies of, of regenerative design and, and restorative design uh, to, to the building design, construction, and operational practices. What do we mean by that? Is that when we say positive or when we say regenerative, what we mean by that is that buildings can save more energy than they consume, can save more water than they consume, you know, basically save more energy than they use, save more water than they consume, remove more carbon than they produce, and most importantly, have a positive impact on the social, physical, and mental well-being of people. And this is possible. This is possible. Today's technologies, today's capacity, today's knowledge is there. And, and there, are, there are organizations that have already made progress towards this positive design. Maybe in a particular element, like maybe energy only, maybe water only. And, but at the same time, what the future proof of the building, the, the future proofing the building means is that we can no longer look at buildings in isolation, either from 
the topics that I talked about, sustainability, health and wellness, yes. uh, resilience and equity, or being disparate from the communities and cities that they are part of, or even the asset portfolios that they are part of. So you can no longer look at them in isolation. You can look at them as opportunities. You can look at them as avenues through which you can positively impact the quality of life of people around the world. Because after all, all of this work, a, a well future-proof building raises the living standard for all. And that's the idea. So being able to really continue to connect that from a design, construction, operational practices and the evolution of technology, not only technology as building technology, but also material science and other principles that goes into really evolving and delivering a greater building is basically where the, where the future of uh, buildings could go. And the good news is we have all the knowledge, the commitment and the tools to get us there. That's the best part of being in 2020 plus. So you are concluding a few lines to the audience. After that, we can take up there is maybe five five minutes for Q and A. So we have one, a couple of questions. So of course, give us the concluding remarks, and after that, I think I think uh, what is important is that is I'm pretty sure people who are uh, hearing this uh, fantastic webinar, a uh, dialogue that you and I are having, uh, have uh, a responsibility to own in the society. Everyone must take action to make this world a better place because a child born today will be in elementary or middle school in 10 to 11 years from now. So we have the responsibility for that child to be given the best environment uh, for its success and for its growth so that its future generation can go to the, go to the next level. So we have, to, we have to do our part of really making sure that not only the actions that we take today, but the actions that we take tomorrow and in the future aligns with the larger goal of making this world a healthy place for all. So that is why we launched this renewed vision called healthy people in healthy places equals a healthy economy. And I would like everybody to read this from right to left. If you want a healthy economy, you need to have a healthy place. And to have a healthy place, people have to feel healthy in that place, in those places. And that can be only delivered by us all committing to sustainability, health and wellness, resilience and equity for all, and being willing to commit to do all we can and pay it forward for the future generations to come so that we can benefit as well as the future generations can also benefit. Because definitely 20 years from now, all of us are going to be alive and healthy and, and prosperous. And we don't want to go through one more crisis like what we are going through right now with this pandemic. We can't even imagine going through this in our lifetime again. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we don't create it for ourselves and for the generations to come. And that can come only through the transformation of the built environment. So thanks so much. Let's go to the first question, which we have received again. Uh, it's always an argumentative point. Whenever I, <laughs> I get this question uh, being asked a couple of times, it's based on the cost for certification. So, yes. so he's asking that, you know, the big builders in India, like, I don't want to mention any name over here, like they go for green building certification. But what about the tier two cities where people have very less knowledge and how, what is the role played by IGBC or USGBC in bringing awareness as well as reducing the cost for green certification? Yeah, I think, I think it is a challenging topic because as we said earlier, our, first of all, our strategy is very simple, educate, implement, celebrate. Educate, implement, celebrate. Education cannot be underestimated. Why typically cost goes high uh, is because that people are trying to apply green rather than integrate green. So this is why we continue to ask people to engage with us, reach out to us, talk to us, right? When you have a project, connect with us. And I can show you thousands of examples in tier two cities around the world that have implemented green much even better than the tier one cities, right? I, we have examples. And then everybody doesn't need to go to platinum. I also recommend that, right? Although, although I love platinum, pushing platinum to the next level is great. But if it's your first project, you don't need to go to platinum. You have to get started on the journey. So the first thing foremost, first and foremost is that is we should all believe that tier two cities can also deliver green projects, including platinum projects. That's the first step that I would always start. Second step is that you reach out to us. Let's engage in a project one-on-one. -on -one with the project team to really understand how we can go to the next level. And third is that we are doing more education. But as I said, we even an organization is not precise. Our is a large organization. We do a lot of work. We have thousands and thousands of volunteers around the world. Still, there are not enough people on the ground. That is why I said earlier, everyone must take action. 
everyone must take the responsibility everyone must commit to the minimum the minimum is to have a green building it's not a, it's not an option you have to start with it and then tell everybody else now we are going to get together to get this done at cost how do we do this effectively and then you may prioritize some strategies that are relevant to you or not but i cannot believe that you will not be able to implement a core set of strategies at cost that's not i i almost will challenge anybody in this world today that you cannot build a building without implementing a core set of sustainability strategies today with the technology knowledge and awareness out there and if somebody is building a such a kind of a building then we really need to analyze what is going on there so i i would say that cost is a myth and and it keeps coming up because we are not doing anything about it and the best way to do something about it is bring a project engage with us let's walk through and let's prove that that premise and that assumption is a little bit uh, incorrect so that's where i would start yeah the next question somewhere in between the interviews you said that 90% of the buildings were built before the green certification era right so here the question is on retrofitting the project still it is not very clear among the builders or the developers or the architect how to get the retrofitted building to get certified that is correct it is a, it's a, it's a very valid point and uh, uh retrofit certification uh is a challenging topic and the reason is that for last 2 to 3 to i would say almost to 25 years we have all approached existing building and new construction the same way in a new construction as you know very well with the green building ready system you go with all strategies you go for an integrative design integrative process design and you try to really have a larger team of architects and construction leaders and and you have developers everybody coming together and on programs like lead really focuses on making sure that we are downsizing the system to upscale the performance of the system so it's a very different approach right you take a very holistic approach you have a larger budget you have an extreme amount of good capacity that you can deploy into a project and get good green projects done for new construction but when it comes to an existing building uh the premise that you have to do changes at the same level is is a little bit far fetched because you cannot make a, a meaningful economic case around it second you cannot drive sufficient motivation among the developer to kind of do the what i call the extreme retrofits or extensive retrofits so the concept of incremental improvement the concept of having a road map to transform the building is kind of currently not very well uh, obvious to many people this is why with the lead version 4.1 our latest rating system we rebuilt our rating system we redefined our rating system to focus on the existing building tendencies which means either you can start with incremental and get eventually to the full retrofit benefit of a sustainability implementing sustainability or you can take one item at a time so let's say if you have 100 buildings you can only focus on energy across all the buildings that's a good way to start or or you can say that okay i'm going to do energy this year for all the buildings next year i'll do water the next year i'll do waste the following year i'll do transportation and the end of it i would have gotten a better indoor air quality which means that i've transformed my entire existing building portfolio with that kind of change so the, the the question is very valid the criticism is valid the challenge is valid because existing buildings cannot be approached the same way as new construction because they need a different approach and we believe performance is the way to go you start by measuring where the building is and then drive strategies into it to improve performance and through that you go to the next that's why i said earlier what gets measured gets done what gets done gets improved what gets improved gets replicated so that's how you turn how it is done yes i think we will still keep getting questions i think we have reached almost towards the end of uh, today's session thank you so much uh, mahesh uh, for being with us and imparting so much of knowledge as and when we get more questions we will be forwarding it to you yes. and so a lot of students have joined uh to listen to you i'm sure they will be having hundreds of questions which is please to you uh thank please you please do share please do share we are happy to respond to them please be part of uh, wf virtual community and we are a knowledge sharing platform we help you to connect to people who who is uh, responsible for building better right so better building environment better environment better construction better industry so uh, please join us and uh, we look forward to your valuable points and uh, what would you like to listen to in our next uh, webinar thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening wonderful morning wonderful day uh, for the entire audience okay.